Welcome to the DLR Libraries podcast, Need to Read. Recommended reads from those in the know. So today I'm talking to Dan Conaghan. Dan is a conservation officer at Birdwatch Ireland. He works designing conservation objectives for special areas of conservation in Donegal, in particular for bog habitats. He is also a Prager, Prager grant recipient surveying for new populations of Ireland's rarest breeding bird, the red-throated diver in the Derry, Derry Bay Mountains. He loves reading, growing food, fermenting and playing the five-string banjo. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining me, Dan. Thanks for having me, Hayley. <laughs> Can you tell me maybe a little bit about your job and what you're up to at the moment and, and how the, the red-throated diver is doing? Sure, absolutely. Um, so my job uh, for the last year and a half or so has been at Birdwatch Ireland in Letterkenny. So I live up in Falkara, up in northwest Donegal. And I work for a project that is an EU project based around a number of special areas of conservation in Donegal, um, trying to work with farmers and with various, and provide expert advice basically for improving the conservation status of some of the rarest habitats uh, or some of the most unique habitats basically in Ireland. Um, some of our upland habitats where we have breeding curlew and we have uh, loads of moss, which <laughs> I'm not an expert enough to name all. Um, but I, I work basically designing these conservation objectives um, and uh, trying to implement them in order to <clears throat> basically improve these areas for, uh, for, for the future and kind of preserve what's there. With the red-throated diver, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a relatively new addition to the, to the wheelhouse. That's a separate grant that I've kind of got on my own. So it's, a, it's the rarest breeding bird in Ireland, and it's at the very southern end of its range here in the world, in globally. Um, you can find it in other, other countries, but in Ireland, there's only six pairs left. Um, right. and, and yeah, they're... Um, are they all in Donegal? Yeah, they are. Yeah, look, <laughs> well... And you know them all. I know them all on a first-name <laughs> basis, you know. <laughs> it's like, they're... Um, they're regulars, they're regulars down the town. <laughs> so are you but, hoping that, are they going to have baby bir- babies or? So that's, the, the hope is this project that I'm doing, um, so it's called, it's from the Prager Society. And uh, basically Prager was a Irish botanist um, uh, and natural historian of some, of quite some renown. Um, and this, he was a really good field biologist, you know, like he was all into sort of getting, getting wet socks and marching up into the moors and identifying ferns and that kind of stuff. So this grant allocates money for field work that's sort of in the spirit of, of Prager's original kind of work. So I'm going to be looking for new populations of the red-throated diver in the Derry Bay Mountains um, because okay. it basically has, they nest on small lakes that have uh, islands on them. And yeah. there's a lot of them that have never been surveyed for red throated diver, there's hundreds of them, but there's but they're within you know the range where there are those six pairs. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go and hopefully find okay. some more up there. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. So I mean, are you expecting that to take a long time? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll find them. Or... I reckon it'll it'll take. Uh, well, I don't know what's out there. You know, it'll take yeah. a while. It'll be a lot of camping, yeah. a lot of hiking. Um, and we're in the breeding season at the moment. So I'm starting off kind of by visiting the, the places where they are yeah. and then working outwards from there. But I don't know, it's an interesting project. It's bringing me to some really wild places up here, you know, um, yeah. really. Yeah. So you have to be kind of savvy with hiking and, <laughs> and careful, I guess. as well. <laughs> yeah. Although it's funny, like, I mean, you know, sometimes you can find wild things right around the corner from a road and, you know, yeah. They're, they're not necessarily in the most windswept and barren place that you think. A lot of times it's just a place where you haven't looked and then you find yeah. something surprising there, you know. And how, and how is Ireland doing with our birds? Like, are, <laughs> have we lost many species or are we gaining some new ones as well as, as temperatures change and that kind of thing? Or well, I mean, a broad question. <laughs> it is a broad question. No, no. I mean, it's, it's a good question. Um, it's overall, I'd say it's pretty, uh, it's pretty pretty bad news you know like there's not a lot of uh holistic approach to kind of nature conservation 
in, um, mixed with agricultural policy in this country. And we faced a lot of really remarkable declines of what were once very common birds across the countryside in the last 50 years. Um, for instance, curlew, which used to be in the 1980s or 1970s, it used to be 300,000 pair uh, breeding in Ireland. And, you know, they were very common. And now there's less than 150 pairs in all of Ireland. And, you know, there's only three pair left in Donegal. You know, like it's yeah. very feasible that they'll be extinct in, in Ireland by 2030. And that story is true for a lot of other birds, for corncrakes and for, you know, there's... Because yeah. I think like as an 80s child myself, like I definitely mm. remember a lot of more bird song. And then uh, and maybe that partly because you're outside a lot as a kid, but... Um, I know people have talked about it over lockdown as well, hearing the birds again. Um, but like, why why are they disappearing? Is it because we're for taking away their habitats, or yeah. or is it sort of a knock on effect of a load of things? Ah, uh, it's it's difficult to say. You know, I mean, well, I mean, some things are very obvious. You know, like they're a lot habitat loss and degradation is one of the main drivers of the bird loss, the bird declines. Um, a lot of times the the switch to high output agricultural farming as opposed to traditional farming practices or um, less intensive ones are, it usually tracks the decline of, of birds. Like for instance, the corn crake, which similar to what you're describing, a lot of people of like our parents' generation or their parents mm. would be used to sort of the, the call of this bird all over Ireland. And now it's, really um you know it, now it's only 140 of them in all of ireland and you know there's actually a few by the house here like we've got like four down right. around here but they're just like in a you know their decline perfectly mirrors the change to mechanized hay harvesting and changes in agricultural subsidies um from the eu basically yeah. i mean you can generally point your finger at certain things but at the same time we are getting you know, we had a very weird addition up to Donegal. <laughs> I think it was yesterday. It was, a, it was a new species for Ireland. So as climate change changes, there are new, new birds yeah. that move. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, you want to tell, what, do you want to tell me about the new addition? <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Who, who is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, he's from Egypt, or she's from Egypt. I'm not sure, but <laughs> it's an <laughs> e Egyptian vulture. Um, All right. That uh, I, I basically was working and there, I just got a text from someone saying like, someone has seen a, what they think is an Egyptian vulture over at this lake by your, by the, by your house, basically. And, that must you know, be, that, get, get out your like sirens and like, yeah. <laughs> not the sirens. But, like, exactly. You put on the red, the, the, the red lights. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You go down the fireman pole and yeah. <laughs> straight. <laughs> Straight into the bird mobile. Yeah, it must be uh, rare, those kind of checks. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the first time it's ever been in Ireland. And I think the previous record in the UK was in 1860 or something. Yeah. Um, so you, so saw, went, you saw it's like a, a proper Yeah. Record. I got there and um, so I, I, I was the second person to ever see it in Ireland there yesterday. So oh, yeah. there was one person who saw it in the, in the morning. And then I was just waiting there for five minutes and then the vulture just flew across in front of me over these sand dunes and it's right. got like, like you know this bird used to be you know it, it's in hieroglyphics and stuff like in Egypt you yeah. know like it was it was worshipped it was seen as holy and it's in like sacred sites and stuff in, in Egyptian mythology it's got this bald yellow face and like this white and black plumage and um, it looks like like something out of another world and there's only 1500 pairs of them in Europe yeah for some reason this one is just flying over these sand dunes in Dunfanaghy. Yeah. Um, and there's and there's not much you can do to like get it to stay. Is it? You're not. You can't interfere. So you just have to <laughs> watch it. No. But why do you think it's here? Do you think it's just? I think it's lost. I think it was. Um, there was. I think it's the same bird. There was one in a few weeks ago that was seen um, in, in in England, and that was the first record since the 1860s in the UK. And I think that's, it's the same bird, I think. I think it's just f trying to figure out where it's, it's where it is. Bird. Yeah. Where it was over in Dunfanaghy, there were a number of dead sheep in a field. And like, I think being a vulture, it saw that and was kind of like, all right, I'll hang out here for a while. 
Right, and how, how big is it? It's the smallest of the European vultures. Um, it also does migrate uh, something like 4,000 kilometers, I think. Um, but, you know, Ireland and the UK are not on its migratory route. But yeah. it, it's a big bird, you know, like you, I saw it and I was like, that is not an Irish looking bird. <laughs> like, yeah. It was like this yeah. bright black and white with a yellow head on it. And, and it's probably confused by the hot weather at the moment as well. It probably I know. <laughs> I was thinking it like <laughs> found the most Egyptian corner of, uh, of Donegal with all these sand. <laughs> there's all these sand dunes there. And it was kind of. Uh... Yeah. And did you get a photo of it? Or... Yeah, I got a video of it. Yeah. Oh, so great. it was like, I think it was the first video of Egyptian vulture in, uh, in Ireland ever. And like, it's a very bad video because I dropped yeah. my phone and I was trying to oh, yeah. do it. And I was like slightly panicking as well, trying to like line it up and everything. But. Managed to get it, yeah. It was, okay. We'll have to share that. Is it on Birdwatch Ireland or? No, I don't think so. No, it's just on my phone. I'll send it to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe I could put a link to it or. Sure. Yeah. It and uh, you did mention like subsidies and things like that. Like I know there's the new sort of the agric- agricultural policy and um, that maybe is going some way towards um, yeah. taking them out and sort of promoting nature friendly farming. Have you? Do you? Yeah, I mean, um, it's enough at the moment, or I mean, a lot of the problem is that none of this ever really goes far enough, you know. Like, you know, until we can have a a structural conversation around the sort of things that led us to, you know, precipitous biodiversity decline um, and climate change. I mean, like, the conversation can't go far enough. I mean, I think that sort of uh, a lot of the projects like the one that I'm involved in at the moment actually um, and a number of others that are funded by the EU such as uh, the Wild Atlantic Project um, like the, these are projects that are based on sort of approaching our natural resources in a way that incorporates people as well as wildlife into kind of the equation that isn't just about excluding people from areas um, to conserve the wildlife and isn't just about prioritizing people over the wildlife. Things about, you know, if we can agree on ecosystem services, which makes sense for people, but also we need to leave room for nature just to be itself. Yeah. Um, it's a complicated equation. It's not, it's not easy, but um, yeah. if we don't have conversations on that scale, um, it won't, you know, we're, yeah. I mean, we're staring down the barrel of a gun really. I mean, like it's, it's already, you know, it's already, uh, you know, precipitously declined in yeah. Ireland. I mean, there's really good books covering the uh, the policy and the reasons for that is in Ireland. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, we can start talking about the books, I guess. Um, <laughs> when, one thing that I, that will help um, I go some way towards, um, I guess, rest- restoration or the future would be spreading the word and people becoming just more aware I mean, that's what um, I guess nature writing tries to do mm. in its many different ways um mm. so how maybe you mentioned um when you were suggesting what to talk about just the different sort of areas of, of nature writing maybe you tell me a little bit about that just so yeah sure people that wanted to get into it they can kind of yeah just understand the different types yeah, and I'll preface this with saying, you know, I'm 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 an, I'm just a nature writing fanatic. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm not I'm not an expert in any way. Or, yeah. Or, or um, but yeah, I I think in the same way that our approaches to the natural world are complicated and varied, um, nature writing as a genre is 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 complicated and has a lot of different strands to it. You know, like in the beginning of it all, you know, you can go all the way back to sort of uh, to, you know, Taoist literature and haikus. And you can see people using the natural world for, for poetic images or in poetic metaphors and finding meaning in the natural world. And, um, you know, that, you know, we as humans evolved in the natural world. It, it, and like, as we've learned to write and kind of create our own mythology, we've always drawn from the natural world and our place in it. Mm-hmm. And I see nature writing as a part of that lineage as a, as a modern society. We're trying to find words and symbols in the net in the natural world for, for explaining that. Um, so, yeah, so I see it as like, you know, back then, but then what we currently call nature writing, I guess, comes out of 
you know, once we started uh, in a European sense, once we started categorizing and observing the natural world, you know, you have like um, Darwin, you have Linnaeus starting to describe sort of the families uh, and the relationships between things that we see. Um, you know, Copernicus, Galileo, these people were describing, it's not nature writing as we would look at it now, but like mm -hmm. they were describing aspects of the natural world. And that slowly basically turned into um, natural history, where it was more, um, it, it's not just factual, but there's also sort of a, an element of observation and an element of personal narrative of the observer as well in, involved in it. Um, you also have this idea of uh, coming into sort of the, the 19th century, you start to have kind of romanticism and these, uh, this kind of backlash against um, the machine or sort of the industrial revolution and this yearning to sort of return to kind of the, the wild or the wilderness, quote unquote, of, of, of the untamed world. And I think when you get this kind of blend between what happened with romanticism and the observation and scientific uh, underpinning of natural historical accounts, um, you start to get an idea of the beginning of the, the birth, I suppose, of, of what we kind of call um, of nature writing. And that, that has shifted as, as we kind of move, move on, you know, <laughs> I don't know yeah. if you want me to continue or. <laughs> well, that's good. That's a, that's a good answer for a non-expert. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so you've chosen a different um, mm. ones that could be activism and that kind of thing. But um, I don't yeah. know what one you want to start with. Um, maybe I'll kind of like talk just a little chronologically, maybe. Yeah. At, at yeah. The, I mean, it, it won't be chronological after after a little bit, but a lot of the kind of nature writing at the beginning, in in my opinion, were influenced by this by this romantic idea of like these pastoral scenes that like were sort of outside of outside of the city, you know, free from all the constraints of modern life in the 1800s and this kind of longing to experience it before it disappears forever. Uh, and, you know, writers like Thoreau and like, you know, in Walden, the, these kind of books, in a lot of senses, um, sort of discuss like the returning to the countryside and embracing this romantic sensibility of it, um, which is um is an interesting idea and uh kind of carries you know the first glimmers of the idea that nature writing as well is inherently um inherently a little political as well actually it's <laughs> like yeah. a lot of these pastoral narratives um about wilderness and stuff you know they were taking place in america where you know european settlers basically came in and moved all the people off the land and then yeah. lived there and defined it as wilderness and kind of like the noble savages of, of sort of romanticism. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question, a lot of these kind of early narratives or adventure narratives like Lewis and Clark, that's a classic one, or mm -hmm. uh, the Malay Archipelago. That was, a, that was a one I read because um, I actually went to the, the same area of, of, yeah. of Wallacea on, on expedition as well. I remember reading the Malay Archipelago when I was there. And yeah, these, these ideas of, of sort of exploring the world and encountering the wilderness um, are interesting to sort of investigate through different lenses now as sort of a modern audience. I guess out of these sort of pastoral narratives and out of these kind of uh, wilderness ideas, I suppose a thing that grew out of them that was positive in my, in my mind was the desire to protect these areas was to, to was to protect um, our natural history and our to find value in the natural world that is external to the human metric of worth or financial worth. There is an environment. There's a difference basically between environmentalist writing, you know, and and basically, you know, just nature writing. I think like there there's a difference between writing about you know, waxing lyrical about the bird on the post while ignoring the bulldozer in the next field kind of thing, you know, like yeah. it's, uh, but environmental writing in my mind grows out of the sort of pastoral agrarian narratives in America. And, you know, people like John Muir, who did a lot of writing, arguing and kind of 
using poetic and evocative language to make his case that these areas deserve to be preserved. Um, you know, he was a scientist and he wasn't mm -hmm. like necessarily a great, um, you know, not a lot of people were reading his papers on glaciation, you know, <laughs> but like, mm -hmm. but he was able to yeah. sort of convey them as sort of these wild places that were worthy of saving. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in a lot of ways, um, that was kind of like the beginning of a lot of these, these environmentalist writing that I feel um, the thread comes up to sort of the big one to talk about, I guess, is Rachel Carson and, and yeah. sort of Silent Spring um, in the 60s. One of the remarkable as well, because she's obviously, you know, obviously a woman and like, you know, up to this point, a lot of, uh, you know, nature writing and pres preservationist and environmentalist um, writing is written by people who own land and by people who, you know, are able to, <laughs> to sojourn into the wilderness and commune yeah. with. So with... One, one voice sort of. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's very much one voice. Yeah. And the voice is overwhelmingly white male and European and, and a, like just on that point there is I made a note of a book I saw that I um new voices in nature writing basically it's called gifts of gravity and light mm. and it's edited by Anita Roy and Pippa Marland and they have they sort of make the case that it the nature writing is usually dominated by writers from similar backgrounds and call it a literary monoculture so they have <laughs> lots of different writers writing about their I'm not sure if they're writing about their areas or where they live or if it's different sort of topics, but yeah, it's just to give it different voices. So. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's much needed. And I think like there's a lot of this kind of like, they call it post-colonial narrative writing of, of nature writing or this sort of strand of post-colonial. So basically this, a lot of the same landscapes and stories that are, have been, written about, but written about from the point of view of people who actually, you know, live in them or yeah. are sort of, uh, you know, there's, there's Latino nature writing movements and there's, um, you know, First Nations and uh, writing movements. There's, there's all sorts and yeah. African American. Like you say, you, could, you never know where the bird might be around the corner in the city where <laughs> you know, they have to, exactly. or yeah. they might've flown from Egypt here by accident. So they could be anywhere. So it's kind of yeah. good that we record. Uh, everywhere exactly and like i guess these kind of new voices in in nature writing you know they've always been there it's just that they haven't been represented in sort of yeah. the main field and that's kind of why it's you know rachel carson was quite a revolutionary figure in the field i think i'd heard the name for years i know i hadn't actually read it but um mm. just silent spring is just, just so haunting just the title of it <laughs> and she was really well respected even before she wrote that but she still had trouble getting it done so, like so powerful were the the um chemical companies or yeah big, big pesticide whatever they're called yeah exactly you know it actually had an impact as well you know like it basically ended up introducing these legislative changes you know like but it's so much more you know it's so much more than just a like a chronicle of sort of human folly <laughs> it's so much more it's it's quite a radical quite a radical expression that like uh progress things that are labeled progress aren't necessarily always good you know mm -hmm. like and that the perceived uh split as well between like us as people as human beings and nature it isn't it isn't necessarily real that the inside of your of yourself of your body is connected to the world around you and that your body has its own ecology, you know, and that, you know, what goes into it with pesticides or in, in the case of Rachel Carson, like th these, all, these things all have a profound, you know, they have, they have an impact on you. Mm. And, um, you know, at the time, I think that was a very radical, radical expression of like how interconnected we are. Um, that period of the 60s mm. was was a time when, you know, a lot of these thoughts started to be challenged. These like long standing hierarchical sort of ideas that we have about our relationship to the environment where, you know, it's in the book of Genesis where like we have <laughs> dominion over the man, the, not to go all biblical, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but, like, um, but, you know, just that basically we, you know, nature is an external fact to us that we are in control of and are able to sort of dominate. Yeah. And 
I think at that period in kind of like the 60s and after that, like, you know, the Industrial Revolution, or sorry, like before, like after the biblical idea, I suppose this idea of like the Industrial Revolution where, you know, we can tame the wilderness, we can tame, we can tame sort of the savagery that's out there and improve livelihoods for everybody. It kind of set up this false dichotomy between us and the environments that we live in as, because we forget that we're animals. We forget that we grew up, you know, that we evolved in. Maybe we just say, for people who don't know, like what it's about, because... Um, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, no, we just obviously, we yeah. know what it's about, but just in case. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so basically Silent Spring was basically one of the, uh, or it was basically an expose of, uh, it was it was released in 1962, and it was basically documenting the adverse environmental impacts on based on the use of pesticides. And it went further than that. It basically accused these huge chemical companies of um, of basically having a propaganda, you know, arm that essentially spreads dis- disinformation, and yeah. that public officials uh, sort of accepted these claims you know without they any had, like like guinness they had ads that said ddt is good for me it's like the pesticide <laughs> pesticide ddt that they put on everything exactly <laughs> they just sprayed it on everything and like it was found to be directly linked to the thinning of eggs um this is just one one case but the thinning of eggshells in peregrine falcons it was linked to the oh, right. um and it was you know it, it was it was an existential threat basically um but it eventually did you know it eventually did lead to the banning of ddt for agricultural uses and you know the the fallout from the book you know basically set up the epa the environmental protection agency in the us um and yeah, she was like unusually successful with with that because usually when you hear these stories it's really depressing nothing ever happens or they get sort of they get drowned out by by the money from these companies, but she got DDT banned and loads of other chemicals probably, I think that were mentioned in the book as well. Yeah, definitely. And then sort of opened people's eyes to, to the fact, like you were saying, it's not external to us, it kills us too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that's what got people listening. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it also had its, like really kicked off a big, you know, a big movement. Like it, there's like, it kicked off a lot of um, eco-feminist ideas and like, grassroots environmental sort of groups that took their lead from um, took their lead from from Rachel Carson you know things like uh, you know we we can discuss them I suppose it kind of makes sense to discuss it with with Rachel Carson because in my mind it's kind of linked yeah um these sort of like they call them ecological humanist <laughs> um, writers uh, that kind of grew out of the environmentalist movement of the 60s and um, people like Murray Bookchin, DuBose, Mumford. Uh, these are kind of thinkers and writers who wrote a lot of theory, I suppose, and a lot of sort of analysis um, that it can be, it, it's not the most poetic, I'll be honest, a lot of the time, it's, but it's, yeah. but it, in my mind, it, it addresses a lot of the same topics that Rachel Carson basically broke into the mainstream with. And um, things like, how, how did we come up with this idea? that we're not a part of the environment and yeah. um, how, isn't it? It's all capitalism. <laughs> it's, it's, Everything is capitalism. They'd, yeah. they'd say it's like, you know, Bookchin would say it's hierarchy, you know, like he yeah. was a strong believer that like, it starts with kind of social issues. It starts with kind of domination of people over other people. And then it kind of spreads on that yeah. logic. I suppose is used in the rest of the world, you know, yeah. and all of a sudden it's not the environment anymore. It's like a blank slate where humans just act out their, yeah. you know, whatever's in their head. Yeah, the it's always. Yeah, I was reading that the, the repercussions of this of that pesticide mm. has lasted three generations. So there's, there's still, I mean, it's probably hard to prove, but elevated rates of breast cancer, hypertension, and obesity in the families of people who were directly linked or maybe lived on. Yeah, and where the DGT was used. And I mean, it's wild, really. I mean, yeah, we've had these huge declines in um, in invertebrate life. You know, there's another great book called The Moth Snowstorm, um, which sort of details the 
the collapse of these um, environmental and nature events that used to happen in kind of like the 60s and the 70s when the author was growing up. And, you know, similar to like what you're saying, it was because of industrial pesticide use, but this was in the UK. And the, the name of the book comes from these, uh, these sort of natural events where moths like would gather on a summer's night and breed. And it would be so thick that it would be like a snowstorm that you, you'd be, it used to be a thing apparently where you drive, you know, for an hour and you'd be driving through like a blizzard of moths, you know, like that was probably absolutely my worst nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> really? but, but yeah, it's probably neat. And are you going to say they got tried to get rid of it then? Oh, well, I mean, they just don't have moth snowstorms basically just don't happen anymore. You know, like they've, yeah. they've, as an event, they, they no longer really exist. Um, yeah. And, you know, there was an unbroken chain of them happening going back to whenever they started doing it, you know, millions of years ago. And since the 60s, over the life of the author, these moth sto- snowstorms basically don't yeah. happen anymore. And in the book, they, they were saying this to me the other day, but they were saying, do you remember you used to get flies on your windscreen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that, is that a thing anymore? Like, when you're driving along or, like, there were just loads of them. I feel like... No. <laughs> I guess it depends how fast, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe that's when, when we were like, we didn't wear seatbelts and we just drove super fast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've heard a few people say that, that like they used to do like long journeys and they don't, um, they don't find them. I mean, there has been like a huge decline of flying invertebrates in, in yeah. Europe, you know? Yeah. Like, I think it, I'm trying to think of the, uh, the number. It's something around 50%, but it's like, a seasonal decline of 76% and a midsummer decline of 82% over the last 27 years, yeah. um, which is huge. And would you still, would you recommend this book, even though it's kind of like what she's talking about isn't an issue now? Well, that, that those particular chemicals, but I yeah. guess to give you a sort of an understanding of... I mean, for me, like, I mean, I really like Silent Spring, but like, I also, I think there's lots of really good writing now. That, that that says that can evoke that same sort of that same sort of, sort of call to action in mm-hmm. modern readers. Um, I think Simon it's Spring is a history as well. It is. It's worth yeah. reading. Like yeah. I would always say, it's worth reading. Um, but I would say it's worth reading um, and also reading loads of other nature writing. That's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's really yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I did read that one of the articles you sent. Um, on the the strip mining in West Virginia. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That was that was, for instance, a really good case of like, um, I don't know, a convincing environmentalist argument look like now. You know, what did you think? Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Um. So, so I'm just ch- checking where it was now. I'll put a link. Um. The the Ori- Orion magazine magazine. Yeah, that's it. And it's called Hell Yeah We Want Windmills. Um. It's very sad. It did remind me of the Aaron Brockovich kind of vibe. Um, well, the, the locals are all sort of getting together. They have a coal mountain watch group and they're trying to stop, I forgot the name of the company now, the big company that's doing all the strip mining. So basically just knocking the tops off the mountains and then strip mining for the coal, I, I, I guess it is. Um, and they were trying to sort of counteract that with the idea of maybe using wind farms and just finding it very difficult to get that to happen but the the kind of the knock-on effects of sort of health issues but also their livelihoods and yeah like cancer is huge there and it seems to seep into the water none of them can drink the water there they all have to have bottled water as well as just all the chemical all the sort of I don't know what you'd call it coal dust or all the sort of chemicals going straight up into the atmosphere yeah it it seemed like they were making ground at the end of the article but I don't know if they've made much ground. I don't think they have the wind farms yet. No. And that, and that, that was good what, um, Good few years ago when the, I think Obama had just gotten in. No, I don't think they've made much ground, unfortunately. <laughs> it, uh... Yeah, because you kind of, you get the sense that they're about to. But it, yeah, it's, it's just very depressing that those, those big energy companies seem to, they're able to suppress it. Yeah, I mean, you know, that is very much in the line of sort of, these environmental justice narratives that kind of come out about, um, you know, there's a lot of cross pollination between these different strands in, uh, in, in nature writing. And like, I think that essay does a good case of pretty, it's, it, it's really like the narrator is real, like common sense as well. Like it's really mm-hmm. kind of written 
in a real way that I think anyone who reads it can kind of be like, okay, that, you know, that's, that's a reasonable argument that the narrator is putting forward for, for renewable energy. But yeah, I don't, I don't think they've made much, much progress. There's, there's another good book that I was thinking of um, called Living Downstream. An ecologist looks at cancer and the environment. And it's basically by a, uh, a biologist, Sandra Steingraber, who she's a biologist and like a writer and a cancer survivor. And she basically got bladder cancer with a number of other um, people in this town when she was like in her 20s. And uh, she survived, but then went on to kind of write this, this book about de- detailing, you know, it's again, like an environmental justice classic, sort of writing about how agricultural pollutants and, um, and fracking, how these things affect people's lives every day. And it's, it's, it's never the people who benefit from them. Um, it's really but, sad. There was a bit of a theme, like Rachel, Car- or Rachel Carson died of cancer mm. relatively young, or maybe it was in her 60s. Yes, yeah, so, and then not long after she'd released the book and then some activists in the um the article as well i think they passed from cancer and then we haven't talked about it yet but aj baker oh yeah he died from cancer from taking from drugs he took to help with his arthritis so Mm, mm. i mean that's a whole other podcast of just (laughs) bad drugs and unhealthy um situation people are put in but anyway <laughs> sorry i interrupted you no not at all okay. no no it's it's pretty it is pretty tragic i mean yeah. i don't know it's uh it's a it's a pretty brutal it must be a pretty brutal burden to kind of carry you know have, having to yeah. both you know be sick and yeah sort of, and also try and expose these enormous um I'm so angry because you know that it's not gonna happen in your lifetime but yeah very noble that you try and do your bit. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's a really, uh, it's a really radical potential that writing holds, you know, like it's a lens that we use to clarify how we feel about the world and how we, what we, you know, how we relate to the environment. Like the fact that a piece like Silent Spring or, um, you know, an, an, an essay like that one, or, you know, it, can result in actual change in the world can can actually shift the parameters through which we view the environment all of a sudden you can't just sell the idea that pollution is the necessary cost of progress it mm-hmm. you can't just sell the idea that it's um you know you can't do that after silent spring you know if, if silent spring is all of a sudden a popular book even though it's just one person's contribution it actually does shift it has the potential to shift a lot um yeah, so I mean, even even though it's this, these uh, these kind of really grim, <laughs> these grim injustices that are these writers are taking on, you know, like they're taking them on with a very powerful tool. I think like writing, people are moved by writing more than they are. People are moved by narratives, and I think more than they are by facts and figures or by like data. I think like the way that people react to climate change is a pretty good example of that. Like mm-hmm. we're moved by things that we can understand and um when there's stories i think it's just our human brains we're just we like stories yeah and nature writing really uh, manages to pair our human abilities to tell stories with you know our human relationships with the environment which i think is really a really powerful really powerful duo <laughs> it is yeah um so we do, we can move on to your next choice. Sure. Whittled Away is just as I mentioned earlier. There, it's it's a very good book on basically the assessment of particularly to Ireland how we've ended up where we are and what where are we like what's 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 the story with our wildlife around us. Um, By the author Pod, Podrick Fogarty. Yeah. 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 He he was at the National Parks and Wildlife for quite some time, and now I think he is like a main office, a main officer for, I think it's friends of the Irish, or friends of the Irish wildlife. I think he's, he's a wildlife campaigner anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, but basically, you know, he's got a lot of front seat sort of view of the policy failures in Ireland that have related in or, or led directly driven 
declines of our native wildlife. And basically, yeah, he works at the Irish Wildlife Trust, I think he was campaigns officer. Um, and the Irish Wildlife Magazine. Um, yeah. He's editor. Oh, was he? Oh, I didn't know that. Um, I've never met him. I, I just read his book and really, uh, <laughs> really liked it. I, I kind of thought it was useful because in a lot of ways, I think we have trouble um, imagining what Ireland and globally, like what the world was like, what it looked like when it was, when it's full of animals and when it's in a healthy ecological state, to be able to know what that looks like, I think is difficult. You know, if the baseline shifts over one generation and it seems piece by piece each five years or something, but at the end of that, you can't, you know, you can't try and conserve something if no one can remember, you know, like what it, yeah. what it looked like or what you're trying to, what you're trying to conserve in the first place. And I think Podrick's book does a really good job of conveying just how much was here, you know, of actually conveying what the world, you know, it was full, it was teeming with, you know, our waters were fi filled with fish and there were, trees you know, everywhere. there were trees everywhere and there were like eagles flying around, like, and now, um, you know, if you were to say, let's try and get back to that, people would be like, that's crazy, you know, like that's, that's, that's madness. But I think it does a good job of conveying that, you know, for most of, you know, if you even go four generations back, there, the world that they lived in, if you looked out, wasn't necessarily a tidy Ireland of neat, high agricultural output fields with lots of fertilizer and lots of, uh, you know, lots of agricultural runoff. It was a world of, of, a, of a vast amount of nature that people lived in as well, you know, like, mm -hmm. that, like uh, you know, means a lot to people who are actually farmers and that yeah. they've lost, you know. But what I like about the book as well is he kind of proposes a way forward or in, you know, an, an opinion from him of a way forward for Ireland, um, which is kind of this idea of rewilding or this yeah. idea of finding a, some sort of way of shifting the mindset that we have towards our natural resources. Maybe we should just leave some actual place for, yeah. for, for nature. Um, you know, it's a very controversial idea. And like, I'm, I don't necessarily, because again, it goes to the same questions that nature writing has from the beginning in that, you know, who determines what's wild and where it is, you know, in, in the case of rewild, you know, there's, there have been times where it's been people from cities who, who want an area, a huge area of wilderness where, you know, people actually live there who have lived there for generations and, um, just because people who live in a city want to visit a place where there are wolves doesn't necessarily mean that there should be wolves there or that that's the right thing to do to, to conserve the wilderness or nature. Yeah. Maybe it's a better word for it. I think anything would be a start, even just to sort of allocate green spaces and yeah. maybe try different things that way. I, I know in, in Australia and the suburbs, there were like every few houses, there'd be a small little reserve of, of green. Um, and I think that's, I do think we need more apartments here for like we need more like obviously the housing situation but there should always be green spaces as well however small. absolutely yeah. yeah and i mean there's a really good um i think it's mumford um uh yeah mumford who i don't know maybe it was dubos anyway it was one of the ecological humanists was actually a town planner and like wrote loads of his works actually on town planning and about the different stages of how these mega cities kind of evolve, like, you know, like London and Tokyo and places. And he was, he advocated a lot for that, like kind of saying how to uh, break down the kind of hierarchy of city, mega city, and then have like all the surrounding area around the mega city be like agricultural high output to feed the people in the city. How can we shift that a bit to kind of, um, to make it a more human place to live really, you know? Maybe I'll like um, talk briefly about uh, the outrun, Amy Liptrot. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, and so the outruns by Amy Liptrot, um, and it was one I read relatively recently, but I I really loved it. Um, it was a story again of uh, it was kind of a different type of a story than the ones that we've been discussing. You know, like we've been discussing ones with a lot of facts and a lot of sort of um, a lot of science kind of thinking in them. 
Um, but I think an important aspect of nature writing as well is, uh, is personal, you know, it's of a personal relationship. Um, oh, there's a pheasant outside the window, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's a personal relationship. It's a personal relationship between, uh, the human and the non-human, you know, and in the outrun, uh, I really loved it. It's, it's the story of, uh, it's a, it's, a memoir, basically, um, as a lot of this kind of new nature writing is, like, uh, you know, there's, you know, H is for Hawk and a lot of these kind of new, like, deep country. A lot of these books are like memoirs uh, woven in with natural history and mm -hmm. with kind of uh, aspects of their self. Um, you know, Robert McFarlane is like a, you know, would be a good example of someone, and, you know, a lot of this as we kind of discussed off air was <laughs> rooted in the Peregrine and J.A. Baker's sort of narrative of a journal of nature observation that also reflected the internal world of the narrator. But the outrun I think does a really good job just because it's so honest and it's so gripping. So she, and it's really familiar to me as well, you know, like she mm -hmm. grows up in, or she, well, she grows up on, on this kind of rural remote area of, of Scotland and then moves to East London, where she kind of, you know, in her 20s sort of floats through a kind of carefree life that mm -hmm. ends up turning dark and kind of ends up becoming, um, ends up becoming addicted to alcohol and having to seek an alcohol treatment center uh, and returns home up to her very remote, <laughs> her very remote family home. Um, mm -hmm. Orkney, and then Orkney the, Islands, yeah. Orkney, exactly the Orkney Islands, and and then ends up, you know, she works as she tries to find out a way to be sober, basically, in in the in this incredibly bleak, sorry, not bleak, <laughs> but the incredibly uh, remote and windswept it's bleak, part. Bleak part. That, it's like very like the wind would cut through yeah. you, and it's you know it's it's a, a wild yeah, exactly place. Wild, yeah, like a rugged place, you know, like a. Yeah kind of a geological place, like mm -hmm. a, a place that's really, um, really sort of, uh, um, yeah, it's got the marrow of the earth in it, you know, like it's really, there's not a lot of humanity um, looking out, but she, she finds the other humans around her, you know, she starts making these connections with people around her. It's a really uh, beautiful story, I think, because the way that she tells it is she slowly starts to observe well, she, she's very observant, both of herself and of the natural world around her. And, you know, oftentimes the chapters have this kind of lyrical piece at the end of the chapter where her prose changes into um, a more poetic description of things. And it's, she's so precise with her imagery that it's really, um, you know, it, it, it really brings you into her mind. And yeah. as she goes on and observes the natural world, she also observes she creates kind of a new vocabulary for herself mm. to understand her own addiction and to understand her, her way of fitting in the world. And I think like, uh, it's a really powerful story of how observation, um, generally, and not just of the natural world, but just observation, um, mm. which is really our de facto relationship to the environment, whatever you call it, how it can be transformational and how, it can result in these unexpected, um, these unexpected and surprising uh, new yeah. new pieces of yourself, you know. And to see her lit up as a human against this non-human background, while also being a part of it, it's incredibly beautiful. And it's her first book, and like, yeah, I, um, yeah, I know she's writing another one, so I'm really looking forward to that one as well. I've seen, I read, or watched an interview with her. She seems really interesting and um it seems it's such a i mean anyone can imagine the sort of the healing power of that like having maybe a breakdown and wanting to go get yeah. away um but it sounds kind of almost a bit buddhist or something just sort of nature force, forcing you to be in the moment and just be aware of of the thing in front of you um yeah and it, but it's, it's on it's like it, it is it is quite like that i think a lot of good nature writing um in questions or interrogates the dualistic way we view the world, you know, as ourself or other. And it has its roots all the way back in, you know, Buddhist literature back in the day was writing about 
the bird on the branch or the, the clouds on the mountain or something, you know, like as metaphors for dualism. Um, but this one in particularly, uh, the pain and the slow reality of growth and change is meticulously described. And it's described in a way that like, um, you just know it's honest, you know, like you read it and you feel like you're reading Amy's journals. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I, do. Um, I haven't read the Outrun, but I, I, I liked, like you mentioned her honesty um, mm. and sort of the poeticness, but she, I did read that she said that she, when she was in London and drinking, um, she found that she couldn't drink fast enough with her friends. Like she had to go home to continue drinking because she couldn't drink at that normal social civilized pace that mm. she was at. She said she's searching for this like energy that she just couldn't get um, or couldn't top, which I guess is a lot of addiction. And then on the Island, then she tried to, she realized that, that that energy is what she wanted, but in a different way, like from when she's yeah. getting that from the nature. With J.A. Baker, similar to Amy Liptrop, is that like, they have this like um, this raw flair for the poetic, you know, like this mm-hmm. kind of, you know, I think there's, there's, you know, there's a quote in J.A. Baker. I think it, it's like the North wind brittled icily in the pleached lattice of the hedges, you know, things like that, that are yeah. all of a sudden it like r- jumps out and just grips you like out of nowhere. Controversially, I think J.A. Baker destroyed his, his original journals of the Peregrine after it went to print. Yeah. I read that. Do you know when he did that? I think, um, I mean, it's, you know, he was quite a mysterious figure, I think. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. one of the reasons was, uh, I think maybe he didn't want to be, uh, you know, he didn't want to have the exact precision of like what actually happened uh, or yeah. the actual sightings of it be kind of, uh, you know, it kind of changes it then, you know, but he yeah. was like, you know, he had the same kind of thing where it would be like a factual journal ostensibly mm-hmm. of bird sightings if you read a chapter in the peregrine you know it's very much like just a journal of of a bird watcher yeah. like i remember when i was working at birdwatch ireland for transition year when i was way back a good few years ago um i was digitizing all the notebooks of this old birder from like the 1920s who was like um and it read like the peregrine. It read, it was just like, you know, yeah. he kept a list every day of his life up until he was like 87 of all the birds that he saw every single day. Right. And like, you can kind of chart his life through the birds that he sees. Like even when he's in like a nursing home at the end of his life, yeah. still when he gets taken out for like a little walk, he like writes down the birds he sees or when he was, you know, in other parts of the world. But yeah, maybe we talk about the, the peregrine then. I know you, you just said a lot about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It is, it is a classic. I've been listening to it with um, David Attenborough reading. Oh, wow. It. Such a classic. And Werner Herzog loves it as well. I think, I think he, it was yeah. like one of the books that he recommends that everyone, uh, all filmmakers read. Like, I yeah, think. I read that and he only has three and that's one of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. Quite, a, quite an enigmatic author. But again, that book does a lot to sort of bridge the gap between natural history of like as just a descriptor of nature and like a narrative of the self as a, a narrative of the human being, you know, like, I mean, Baker's there as an observer in every section, you know, like it's so just for maybe for people who haven't read it, it's basically this guy who, you know, he wasn't actually, I don't I think he wasn't a bird bird, like he wasn't professional or anything, but he yeah. was just obsessed with the Peregrine Falcon, like it, in ten, love with it. Really. Ten years. It's condensed down from 10 years. Yeah, for 10 death. years, he basically goes out and tries to just see every peregrine falcon that he can see and follow it for as long as they can, as he can. Um, and basically falls in love with the bird. And like, but the book is full of like these incredibly precise details about like how much a peregrine falcon's heart weighs or like how many feathers are left when a peregrine falcon kills a pigeon as opposed to another type of predatory bird. And as the book kind of goes on, the boundary between, I guess, man and bird sort of blurs and he, but he tells it with such a precise cinematic quality, you know, each individual record, if you opened it, reads like a bird guide or like a bird journal. But if you read it overall, it's a narrative of, of sort of blending with the, uh, blending with the environment and the way he writes as well. is so imitated. Like it's so, it's so like wire sharp in terms of his adjectives and his, uh, his similes, you know, 
like he described he, he describes a blackbird as like a, a small mad puritan with a banana in his mouth <laughs> basically <laughs> like describe, describing like you know <laughs> like the way yeah. that a, a blackbird is sitting um <laughs> maybe that's why he got rid of his notes because he brought i mean they, maybe they sound so basic compared to this like really refined well thought out yeah as in the book <laughs> i mean he can turn it on like the thing is like he's got this like extra gear that he shifts into sometimes like like mm. when he's describing when he's writing like that and amy liptrop does it as well where all of a sudden the prose kind of elevates above sort of a description and turns into something else um, yeah because um yeah he, he he he's almost possessed isn't he? Mm. he he doesn't put himself in it but like he's there the whole time obviously as the observer but Exactly. Like, uh, he's, he's, there, he's there the whole time. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's what like, a, you know, it's what like a shaman would do, like back in old, you know, if you think about what he's doing, writing the Peregrine, it's almost like yeah. what someone would do in like a very early stage of human history, yeah. you know, like put on yeah. the mask of the Peregrine Falcon and like dance around the fire or something. Yeah. But like, he's doing it through the lens of sort of a scientific and natural historical society where he's kind of expressing this very old human relationship with the environment. Mm. But, um, but he you know, was, by the end of the book... I don't know if he was a loner, but he, he didn't have a phone and he mm. kept to himself and he didn't yeah. want people around him knowing what he did every day. <laughs> no, no, he was really, like, secretive, I think. I think he... Yeah, like, he kept his name secret for ages. I think it, there was, like... There's been a good bit of detective work, I think, by this writer who's also a very good writer, Mark Cocker, um, who he did, you know, there's a lot of this modern generation of, of nature writing that work, that draw directly from the Peregrine and, and, and are, you know, sort of, uh, you know, trying to evoke the same kind of things. And Mark Cocker was one of them, but he did a lot of detective work and sleuthing around to figure out yeah. some details about Baker's actual yeah, life. If he hadn't been so private, probably probably wouldn't care. <laughs> no, no, exactly. We just if he'd been on Twitter, you know. <laughs> yeah, just... yeah. Do we have peregrines here? We do. Yeah, we've got them. Um, you know, we've got a lot of peregrines. We've got well, actually, well, it's funny because they're one that like do really well in very urban environments. You know, they they do really well in like London has quite a high peregrine population. Yeah, um, and there's some birds that are like that that you know, have collapsed in the countryside, but have boomed in the city. Like the, um, um, yeah, black red starts, you know, they basically, the main population in the UK is in, is in London because yeah. empty building sites imitate the habitat that they had before the industrial revolution. So yeah. whereas their population have crashed elsewhere, they, they're, and they're, they're in the city. buildings that like, I know, I was outside one of the the big art galleries on in London there years ago now, but they had there were bird watchers there with their telescopes. Yeah, and the Tate Modern, I think they've got the them up Tate, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. got, got <laughs> really them up on the roof. There. <laughs> <laughs> they're really cool. I've seen them here once, once or twice. The fastest animal, I think, when they're in a full per in a full stoop of any animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred hundred miles per hour. That's what. Yeah, I think. that's what um, David Insane. said. Insane. <laughs> It's a truly terrifying thing to imagine if you were a wood pigeon yeah. or something that yeah. something like that is out there. <laughs> Good. Yeah. You know, I never have had to deal with a threat like that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that be... He writes at the beginning just about how he has to be kind of reliable for the birds to, to trust him. So he's to wear the, he wears the same clothes. He enters the field the, the same way, same time. I don't know if that's across the bird across the <laughs> across the board with bird watching like would that be something you think about when you're bird watching like yeah i mean consistent with what you yeah. wear or i mean i think um yeah i mean for me you know i haven't formed a, a close relationship with with birds well, well i have but not in the same way that he has you know like he yeah. he basically is um is kind of obsessed with, with these birds and almost like directly with the exact birds. He knows them individually for each individual bird. You know, I've, it's only since moving here. But you've only being, got six, six of them, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess there's not, it's not too different. 
I mean, like I've got my Peregrine waiting to be written. It's it's yeah. it's, it's just on the red throated diver, you know. <laughs> but um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I I do the same kind of thing when I'm looking for rare birds or when I'm, you know, looking for any birds or any nature. Like I do the same kind of field craft that that he did. I mean, do you have tips for any amateur bird <laughs> bird watchers? Yeah, sure. I mean, like, I know the Irish Times, was the Irish Times gave the lovely posters over lockdown, mm, which I had mm, on the fridge. Mm, um, I mean, yeah, that was fun. They're oh, like posters of bird identification. Well, when I just, I, I just, the Irish Times did that colourful pull out the last mm. two summers. Oh yeah, I saw them. Um, yeah, and that I had, had it in my fridge, and that was my bird watching, so I could just point out what I saw. Yeah, I think like that's the biggest thing is if, even if you learn you know, one or two birds, like, or, you know, new, new birds per month or something, all of a sudden you start to notice them. It's like all of a sudden they appear around you, you know, they were always there before, but if you learn the names for things and if you learn the calls of birds, eventually you start, the, the questions in ecology start with what is there, you know, like you start being like, what is that bird that flies by my feeder? Or what is that thing that I yeah. saw? And when, once you start to quantify what is there, you can notice how it changes. You, you notice when it's not there and you notice when it hasn't come to your feeder or, you know, you notice when the corn crake, when you don't hear the call of the corn crake anymore. Yeah. Um, like these questions that start with kind of this what, and there's lots of apps that help with that. You know, there's like plant net for like identifying plants or, um, you know, just putting a bird table outside your window or like a pond, those kind of things will attract birds mm -hmm. Um, the more different types of habitats that you can provide, um, the more likely that you'll get a good diversity of, of things visiting you. But I mean, that's how it starts. And then e ecological awareness grows from that. Once you, it, mm -hmm. everything is rooted in observation. And then eventually you start thinking, why, you know, why has, why is there less, why, why are there less birds now than there were? Why are there more birds than there were, you know? Yeah. Um, and in but terms yeah. of like people's gardens, should they be trying to yeah. encourage I mean, the biodiversity? To I the think leaving a patch country? in your garden where you can let it just go wild, you know, just let, mm -hmm. let nature do its thing. Um, it doesn't have to be your whole lawn or something, but I mean, I've got a big bunch of wildflower meadow um, along the side of, of, of where I live. And they often say a mosaic of habitats because the more edges that there are, you know, like if there's a lawn and then an edge of shrub and then an edge of wildflower meadow, the yeah. more edges that there are, the more likely you're going to get a high level of diversity of invertebrates and then yeah. birds as well, you know? Yeah. And so everyone can do, do their part to kind of encourage it. But I mean, I think also reading and learning about how we can rewild ourselves as well as the environment and the way that we think about and change the modality of, but the way that we think about the environment is as crucial as critical. Um, yeah. Are, are there any other of the books or articles you wanted to talk about? Or? Um, yeah, there's two, which are like really good um, short essays that mm -hmm. are, I think are kind of good. They're in this anthology of nature writing, um, which is a really good one um, by, uh, by Sean Prentice and Joe Wilkes, um, Joe Wilkins. Um, I'll send the link to you, but yeah. there's, there's one, uh, they're both examples of, I suppose, what we discussed earlier about kind of this post-colonial attitude towards nature writing, where it's sort of unheard voices um, and other ways of looking at the wilderness that are, are not necessarily from a Eurocentric point of view. Um, and one that I really like is Tales from a Black Girl on Fire, or Why I Hate to Walk Outside and See Things Burning by Camille T. Dungy. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a really good short story. Um, basically, very much, I'm not even sure it's a character. I, 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 it feels so honest, you know? Like it's, mm. But it's about how um, this African-American woman in, uh, in the States, in the South, in Virginia, um, she kind of details her, her nervousness with fire outdoors, you know, with the history of sort of racial segregation and, um, and you know, race-related violence, like with the Ku Klux Klan and with uh, lynchings. And in her 
world, and, and she basically details this kind of dinner party or this kind of camping party that she has with all of her quite sort of urbane friends up in the Northeast uh, where they're outside and they have a campfire. But it kind of merges her fear of, uh, her fear of fire because of race, racially related <laughs> violence merges with her just fear of, uh, of the type of person that um, starts a forest fire kind of thing. And it's, yeah. uh, it's a really well told narrative in, in, in the way that it, it links together, I suppose, some of the threads from a different angle. It, it links them yeah. together in a way um, that kind of... Uh, Human trauma in, in... Yeah, exactly. The larger environment. Precisely, sure. yeah. yeah. And in the other sense, the, uh, the, there's one burning the shelter, also related to fire, which I thought was really good. It's, it's called Burning the Shelter. It's by Lewis Owens. Um, he details he's a park ranger who's sent up to, um, to this mountain peak uh, kind of shelter by the National Park Service in America to burn the shelter in order to return the area to nature, you know, like to kind of re- like get rid of human habitation. And he goes up and burns it and then is coming back down and runs into these two um, American Indian uh, sort of grandmothers who are on their way up to the shelter. And mm-hmm. it turns out that they use the shelter and they've used it for like, you know, generations or to kind of go and forage and stuff uh, in the surrounding area. And, you know, he, he ends up telling them that he's just burned down the shelter and, and uh, you know, they're, you know, they, they, they're very polite and they don't mind, you know, and, but like, he realizes what a thing he's done, you know, like he re- he realizes the horror of like what he's done. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it, again, like a really, it's another cut on sort of how, um, on what is the wilderness? <laughs> like who, like yeah. on, you know, what, how, how do we deconstruct the, these ideas fairly to, to sort of all of us? And anyway, those are two that I just wanted to, to, to refer to as sort of good examples of kind of post-colonial okay. narratives in nature writing, which are starting to open up a lot more. Mm-hmm. Great, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put all these in as a link mm-hmm. as well. Okay. Um, um, so that's great. Um, just, I just wanted to mention, I, I saw something interesting online. Um, the Irish Writers Centre have started a climate writing group, mm. um, Writing for Change. So they, I think it's just started, and, and um, I think if anyone's interested, they should look at their site, but they meet once a month. And it's kind of to promote or encourage writers to promote positive climate solutions in their work. And then their longer term goal is to assist writers across Ireland and internationally to form climate writing groups. Um, I thought that it's good that there are people out there trying to, <laughs> to raise awareness. Oh, yeah, for sure. And just to sort of incorporate it, I guess, as well into um, different styles of writing, um, like you've covered, which is really interesting. Mm. And so thank you very much for talking to me today. Thank you for having me, Hayley. <laughs>